It's my opportunity to have the uh, next induction to the NAA Hall of Fame. You know, during our life, we often have someone that becomes a true friend. They're a mentor to us, someone that we can look up to, go to for needed advice and wisdom when we need that. And our next, next inductee is one such person. He was born March 27, 1948, in Richmond, Virginia. Growing up, he was both a crack shot with a shotgun and a rifle. He once competed in the New York City Marathon. He was an excellent dog trainer. He enjoyed working with his dog, Jack, a lab. He was a graduate of the University of Richmond and the University of Virginia School of Law. He was engaged in the practice of law beginning in 1981, specializing in commercial law, contracts, torts, and litigation. And he was a graduate of the Missouri Auction School, and he was a licensed auctioneer. I met this person because of the NAA. In 2004, he was doing a seminar and his, and his presentation was on boarding the legal landmines, and it was full of a lot of practical advice. Our company had not thought about retaining an in-house attorney at that point, but we thought there were some advantages to that, and we really liked our inductee. We made him an employment offer, and he became uh, the vice president and legal counsel at J.P. King Auction Company. You know, as an auction company owner, you're always concerned when you bring in a new executive and how they're going to be able to work with the other employees. But this individual quickly became close, a close friend to all of our, all of our employees. He became a trusted advisor to me and our board. He was the kindest, most generous person. He was articulate and very intelligent. He was a superb storyteller, a sincere advisor, and he was a friend. He had the ability to break a matter down in circumstances and make wise recommendations. Our inductee assisted in uh, proposed auction law in a number of different states. He taught seminars on law and ethics in 31 states and several Canadian provinces, in addition to writing over 100 articles a year for such publications as our own NAA magazine. His columns, as well as his seminars, dispense practical legal advice on key auction issues. And uh, he spiced it up with a lot of folksy humor and special insight to human nature. He was a superb storyteller. He was a sincere advisor. He was a friend to auctioneers. He often took calls, answered questions, and gave advice at no charge. He taught legal classes at the Reppert and Mendenhall Schools of Auctioneering. He was interviewed by numerous media on auction law and issues, by magazines such as the Wall Street Journal, the Los Angeles Times, Money Magazine, Forbes, NB, NBC. In 2004, the National Auctioneers Association awarded him as President's Award of Distinction. And as a columnist, he never minded taking the heat that his art articles often dispensed. He was steadfastly adamant in promoting auction integrity inside the auction ring and within our auction industry. His weekly columns were peppered with a lot of uh, folksy background. Not many people could turn a story of hunting with dad into a lesson about auction law. He actively supported his seven children in their endeavors. He spoke of the wisdom he received from his parents and often talked about his ambition to educate cousin Junior, while also admitting that he learned a lot of life's lessons from him. He was an avid Alabama football fan. The road tide was evident in everything he did. My brother Scott King tells a story about one time getting a message, and he called this individual in and said he had a message, an important message that he needed for him to listen to. Thinking that he had a deep legal issue, he came in with his legal pad and his pencil carefully leaning over the phone so he could listen very carefully. My brother Scott knew he had him hooked at that point. He played the message, and our inductee just giggled and had him play it over again, giggled excitedly every time. See, the message was from Alabama head football coach Nick Saban that was talking to our company about a pro property he was interested in selling. He was often seen with his nice gray suit and his Alabama ball cap. 
When he first came with our firm, I had him go down to the Alabama Gulf Coast with me on a meeting, and we met with a prominent businessman at his home on Mobile Bay. And as we walked to the front door, I looked at him, and he had on, once again, that nice gray suit, and to my horror, I had on that rad, red Alabama ball cap. <laughs> I quickly asked him if he would take the cap off, which he did, uh, but I soon realized that that was just a part of who this person was. Many of you figured out right now that I'm talking about Steve Prophet. His advice often rings through my ears today. I remember the day when Steve came to tell me that he'd been diagnosed with cancer. He was very distraught. He was concerned for his children and for his family. And Steve was a very private person, and he didn't want others to know. He told me that I regularly hear from a lot of people, and I appreciate their expressions and of uh, concern and hope, but he just didn't like to discuss the details of this situation. He explained to me that it upsets him and it pulls him down too much to think about it, and that he'd prefer to keep his medical condition private. So we honored his request. His cure fears came to fruition as the cancer progressed. He once wrote to me that I'm fighting a disease that is constantly working to kill me as my doctors and their medicines constantly work to kill it. One will prevail and one will fail. This is the battle of battles for me. It's a battle of my life for my life. And all I can say is that I will not give in and I will not go quietly. And I'm honored as hard as I can or I'm working as hard as I can to give my doctors every chance to bring me home a winner Oh, I want that so very much. What started out as follicular cancer transformed into an aggressive lymphoma and transformed yet again into acute leukemia. Steve was staying in Virginia where his family and his sister Bonnie could assist him with his treatment regime. He once wrote to me that only God knows the future. He will write the end of this story. Please wait for me. I'm trying as hard as I can to get there. When it became apparent that Steve wouldn't make it, he wanted to come back to Alabama to be with his family and his children. On December 23rd, we arranged that flight to bring him home. He told us that this was the best thing that had happened to him, but he was always so kind with his praise. Steve Prophet died two days later on December the 25th at his home in Rainbow City with his family. And Steve's not here to accept this award, but he's here with us in spirit. And if Steve was accepting this award, I'm sure he'd have a story or a joke that he'd be telling right now. Tonight, Steve's family with us. Steve's oldest son, Lee Prophet, will be coming and speaking on behalf of the family. And I ask them to come forward. And I ask you to join me in our newest inductee, J. Stephen Prophet. Thank you for the kind words, Craig. Uh, I know my father would be uh, extremely honored. Uh, he definitely loved the auction industry very much, and uh, I know he enjoyed every opportunity he had to come to the uh, NAA conventions and, and speak to everyone. So on behalf of my, uh, my family, thank you all very much.